before you continue with this one, you must have made sure that you already watched the basics of organic reactions, which include determination of whether any reaction is addition, elimination, or substitution, um, determination of our agents like free radicals, nucleophiles, and electrophiles. We defined that in our previous recording, as well as definitions of redox. Now, before we continue to alkanes, let me clarify one last thing. Usually, when we clarify or when we state or specify a mechanism of reaction for a particular functional group, we always combine our reagent and our pattern of reaction. Okay. And by the way, this is only applicable to addition and substitution. We can only use uh, what I said just now for reactions where we actually add something or a reagent. So let's say I added B, which is an electrophile. Uh, that means that my reaction is called an electrophilic addition. And usually to symbolize that, we put the addition as the big letter. And then the reagent, in this case, what I just said right now is electrophile, right? As a subscript. So, we actually read this as electrophilic, so you read this first, and then this one, addition. Electrophilic addition. Or let's say I have another addition reaction, but instead, I found out or I analyzed but that my reagent is a nucleophile. Then, I can call my reaction mechanism a nucleophilic addition. Or for example, if I have a substitution reaction, wherein the reagent I added is a nucleophile, then I can call my complete mechanism nucleophilic substitution, and so on and so forth. Of course, since elimination does not need any reagent, it doesn't need a nucleophile or an electrophile or a free radical, we always write our elimination mechanism only as the big capital letter E. And you should know that as we go ahead to the next topics. We start now with alkanes, introductory parts. Alkanes were known as paraffins. Paraffin was a, an old term, Latin term, for little affinity. This means little affinity. And that was due to the fact that alkanes are unresponsive or unreactive to most other agents that react with other organic compounds. So meaning... Most other organic compounds have their own reactions, like alcohols have these reactions, alkenes have these reactions, carboxylic acids have these reactions, all of those which we will discuss in the next discussions. But one, one unique thing about al alkenes is that they don't really care about nucleophiles or electrophiles, meaning they're just unresponsive, and, that, and that's why you call them paraffins, little affinity. And remember, that has a lot to do with the fact that since alkane means all my carbon-carbon bonds are single, and remember that if I have single bonds, you always classify those bonds as sigma overlaps. That means that all my al in, in my alkanes, all the bonds are purely sigma bonds. Now, when we discuss the distinction between sigma and pi, you must have remembered that sigma bonds are way stronger than pi bonds. And if the question is, if I, might, if I have a compound whose bonds are all hard to break, then how can I even subject it to any reaction? And the answer is, well, we can't. So that's why they don't react to most things. All right. Now, another general property or let's say properties of alkanes is that they have particularly the low density, low melting point, and they are generally nonpolar, water insoluble, or in other terms we can call it as lipophilic. Okay? And here you notice I'm not discussing them in full detail because for most of you guys you should have discussed already the basics of intermolecular forces that allow us to analyze why alkanes have low density, low melting and boiling points, and are generally nonpolar. If you still have little idea about it, then I suggest you start first by reviewing your intermolecular forces. 
One al uh, one reaction of alkenes, I mean alkanes, is combustion. And combustion does not require a nucleophile or electrophile. Literally, combustion is the common term that we use for burning of alkenes, usually when we burn fuel. So, combustion is technically oxidation with the aid of heat, which, well, if you can imagine it, with oxygen and heat, we make fire. And that's combustion, right? Now, we have to take note that there are two main types of combustion. It depends on how much oxygen is present in the environment. If I have sufficient or I have abundance of oxygen around me, my combustion reaction can be classified as complete. Meaning, let's say I have a hydrocarbon. When I say hydrocarbon, it doesn't necessarily mean alkane, right? It can be alkenes or alkynes as long as they only contain carbons and hydrogens. So that's why I use the general formula CH, CX, HX here. So this can be an alkene, this can be an alkane, this can be an alkyne. Any of those would do. And if I burn it using oxygen, what happens is that all of my carbons are completely oxidized by adding to it two molecules of oxygen, giving us the product CO2 or carbon dioxide. Also take note that as for our hydrogens here, our hydrogens are also oxidized and they, they actually become molecules of water. So remember, if your combustion is complete, there are only two products, carbon dioxide and water. Also take note that depending on the situation, you may be asked to balance the chemical equation to, 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 to follow the same number of atoms before and after the reaction. But we won't do that here. For partial combustion, the condition for partial combustion, as, is, as it is written here, is that imagine that we have a scenario wherein there is limited oxygen access. Okay? So now, if I have limited oxygen access, things are going to be a little bit different. So, as usual, our goal in combustion is to oxidize our carbons. And sometimes, you actually become successful. So there are some cases that in partial oxidation, you successfully oxidize carbon completely to become carbon dioxide. But how about the other carbons? Let's say some carbons already lack oxygen the moment they are oxidized. So we can imagine that for some carbons that are unfortunate, they cannot anymore get to oxygens. You can imagine we are already running out of oxygens. So some poor carbon atoms will now have to deal with only just a single oxygen atom because of the limited amount of oxygen. And some carbons are so unlucky, they don't have even a single oxygen. They're just eliminated as elemental carbon, which is a black substance that we often call the soot. Also take note that just like complete combustion, our hydrogens in partial combustion will later on be converted to water. Remember that CO is read as carbon monoxide and is a poison to humans. And that is why partial oxidation is going to give us potential carbon monoxide poisoning. Also, that is the reason why, for example, some quote-unquote dirty vehicles, meaning we have uncleaned uh, engines, okay, they give off black smoke. Okay? That's because the combustion is incomplete and the black or the gray smoke you're actually looking are the incomplete combustion products like the suit. Okay? And that's not all for alkanes. We have what we call free radical substitution of alkanes. And meaning, although a while ago I told you that alkanes do not react to nucleophiles or electrophiles, don't forget that electrophiles and nucleophiles are not the only reagents that are there. We also have what we call free radicals. And in order to make free radicals, I mentioned in the previous discussion, that you need the help of sunlight. That's why going back here, notice once again we have the help of sunlight. Also note that sometimes we can write it as UV instead of HV, but it would be it would mean the same thing. Let's say I have a halogen molecule X2. This can be Br2, Cl2. Usually it's the two of those. And by the help of sunlight, 
we have here the so-called homolytic cleavage giving us two free radicals of the halogen. Okay? So that is what you call initiation step because you need sunlight to make your free radicals. That, this, is the, this is the first thing that should happen. Without our sunlight, we cannot make, we cannot make our free radicals in the first place. Now, let's say I already have my two halogen radicals, which came from step one. So, I'm just putting them back here in the next step. Propagation means that, let's say I have an alkene here. What's going to happen is that one of the two X's will go to carbon and will take the place of one of those four hydrogens. Long story short, if I'm going to remove one of those four hydrogens, we will only end up with three. And I did just I just told you that one of the just one one of the free radicals will take the place of that H. So you can now imagine that out of the four hydrogens, one hydrogen has been kicked out, and this has been replaced with one of those free radicals. Notice that my H here that has been kicked out can pair with the other X. Remember, there's only one here I attached. There are two of these. So the other one, if you're asking, hey, where's the other X? It actually joined with the hydrogen that was kicked out. And as it seems, it's as if we, we, we had two atoms that switched places. It's as if this CH4 gave out its H in exchange for one of the two Xs in this reagent. Since there was a switch of the reagents, the most appropriate of the three types of patterns switch right the magic word is switch or exchange it's best called substitution and since we used free radicals to perform substitution then the complete mechanism is free radical substitution and take note that this is a chain reaction meaning that once you get things going we have free radicals this will happen again and again and again most likely this will happen as long as i have hydrogens to remove so like, hey, I have three hydrogens. The, the idea is, as long as I have like, like three hydrogens, I can remove one and replace it with another radical. Then after that, I have two more hydrogens left. I can add another one, uh, another free radical. I'm going to replace another H. Then lastly, if I have one more hydrogen left, I can add one more halogen and the last hydrogen will be gone. Now, after all of those things I said, we can, can, we can come up with a molecule wherein I have a carbon without any hydrogens already because all of those hydrogens have been replaced or substituted with my free radical halogens or excess. Now, what if I have two more halogens here? Normally, we know one of the excess will go here and will replace the H. But now, look at my compound. There is no H anymore. In that case, it's as if we now hit some kind of plateau, like, hey, we don't have anything to bind to anymore, and the two X's may decide to just reunite together, giving us X2. And because you notice, in both my CX4 and X2, there's no more free radical remaining, the chain reaction stops, and this is the process of termination. So you know that it's termination usually when two radicals, like these two X dots, reunite. And this is the only technical reaction for alkanes because otherwise, if it's not a free radical, alkanes, again, let me repeat, will really, really be unreactive to probably everything else. Okay? So after this, the next thing we will discuss are alkenes. And as you will notice, they react really very differently.